Hey, hey everyone. everyone, I'm Emmanuel Kadosh. And I'm Shanna Fold. Here at ILTV, it's our job to deliver you Israel's most pressing stories. So for the latest updates, please make sure to follow ILTV on Instagram at ILTV underscore Israel and to like ILTV on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to ILTV on YouTube. Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kircha. Coming up in today's newscast, New York police arrest the man suspected of stabbing multiple people in a Hanukkah ceremony. We'll reveal the record amount of tourists that visited Israel this year and where they're coming from. And as a decade comes to an end, we'll meet the Israelis that you'll definitely want to watch out for in the next 10 years. The man believed to have stabbed multiple people in a stabbing spree at a rabbi's home this weekend in upstate New York has now appeared in court and is being charged with five counts of attempted murder. On Saturday night, dozens of Orthodox Jews gathered to light candles for Hanukkah at a rabbi's home in Monsey, New York. Little did they know their night of celebration would soon become a crime scene. At around 10 p.m., an armed man broke into the ceremony with a machete and began to stab everybody in his way, injuring five people. That man has now reportedly been identified. His name is Grafton Thomas, a 37-year-old who was arrested within just two hours of the attack in Manhattan, New York, covered in blood. Thomas has pleaded not guilty to five counts of attempted murder and his bail has been set at $5 million. His family's pastor says that Thomas has been suffering from mental illness and that his family believes that was the cause of the alleged stabbings and not anti-Semitism. But this attack has been condemned as yet another incident of hatred towards Jews and officials from Israel and the United States say more measures must be taken to protect the Jewish community. Today. I announced additional NYPD presence. On Friday, I told you we were reinforcing three neighborhoods, Williamsburg, Crown Heights, and Borough Park here in Brooklyn. We will add additional officers on top of that, which we already plan to do Friday, so that people in the community will see our officers present in front of houses of worship and out on the streets. We have to give people a sense of security. And we have to show that this horrible trend we've seen over the last weeks will be stopped dead in its tracks. This attack comes after a week of anti-Semitic assaults in New York, one for nearly every day of the Hanukkah holiday. And most of the suspects are either still at large or have been released. One suspect in particular who admitted to screaming F you Jews and assaulting three Orthodox women on Friday even committed another attack just a day after her release on Saturday. And on top of that, she still has an open harassment and assault case from Brooklyn in November of 2018 as well as no jail time felony for criminal mischief in Manhattan, a case which he reportedly failed to make court appearances for. In other news, the United States military is now taking responsibility for a series of airstrikes in Iraq and Syria on Sunday against Iran-backed Kataib Hezbollah militias. At least 25 Hezbollah fighters have been killed and 55 more are wounded following United States airstrikes near the western Qaim district on the border with Syria. And according to the Pentagon, the strikes targeted three locations in Iraq and two in Syria, including Hezbollah weapons storage facilities and military headquarters. Four Kataib Hezbollah commanders are reported dead. But the attack comes as a response to the Hezbollah group's alleged Friday attack against Kilkuk. At least 30 rockets are said to have been launched by the Iran-backed proxy group in that attack, killing an American civilian contractor and injuring four U.S. service members as well as two Iraqi security officers. Myself, Secretary Esper, uh, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff Milley came uh, here to Florida today to brief the President on the activities that have taken place uh, in the Middle East over the course of the last uh, 72 hours. Uh, I will leave to uh, Secretary Esper to talk about the military activity, but I want to put it in the context of our policy with respect to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, the attack that took place at an, against an Iraqi facility threatened American forces. This has been going on now for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks. This wasn't the first set of attacks against this particular Iraqi facility and others where there are American lives at risk. And today, uh, what we did was take a decisive response that makes clear what President Trump has said for uh, months and months and months, 
which is that we will not stand for the Islamic Republic of Iran to take actions that put American men and women in jeopardy. Uh, we, will, we will always honor that commitment to take decisive action when that takes place. And we continue to demand that the Islamic Republic of Iran act in a way that is consistent with what I laid back out back in May of 2018 for what it is that we expect Iran to do so that it can rejoin the community of nations. Meanwhile, Iran is currently in the midst of a four-day naval drill in cooperation with Russia and China, and Iranian officials and news agencies say that it shows how strong Iran is in the face of the U.S. But Israel is applauding the United States strikes, with IDF Chief of Staff Aviv Kochavi predicting that 2020 will bring with it a high possibility of war with Iran and its proxies along the northern border. Now, the question here is, how will the U.S. airstrikes against Hezbollah in Iraq impact Israel? Well, joining us to find out is uh, Dan Chouftan, Middle East expert from Haifa University. So our first question is, why is the United States carrying out these airstrikes right now? Finally, the United States is responding, although very moderately, to what the Iranians have been doing in the last few months, particularly the attack on the Saudi oil installations. The Saudis are under enormous pressure from the American sanctions. The sanctions are extremely effective. And what they're trying to do is to present the American public with a choice of either capitulation to Iran, as Obama did, or war. And then to say to Trump, if you don't want body bags in, for the next elections, mm -hmm. then you will have to capitulate to us. So they have started major military attacks, offensive provocations against the United States, assuming that the United States will not respond. Right. Or if they respond, they can come back to the American people and say, you see, he's leading you to war. Well, so, well, so is that a false choice? Is, no. it, is it one or the other? No. No, no, definitely not. This is what Obama tried to sell to the American people. You can either capitulate or have war. If this reminds you of something that we call appeasement, I don't think you're mistaken very much. Mm. This was the attitude. The attitude was, we cannot afford to confront Iran. And if you don't want to confront Iran, you've lost the Middle East. And there are major global implications for it. So, so who are the biggest actors in Iraq and Syria right now, uh, aside from Iran, maybe? The most important element is Iran in these areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a, an unstable government in Iraq, you have in Syria, Assad that is trying to deal with the remnants of the civil war. But Iran is trying to establish in Iraq and in Syria, particularly in Syria, a major military base that will threaten Israel to such a point that Israel will not be able to respond. Now, let me explain the broader context of right. it. Iran tries to dominate the Middle East. And because Arab states are basically a failure, all of them are a terrible failure, and Iran is a strong society and a strong country, they identify an opportunity to have hegemonic power in the whole mm -hmm. uh, region. So they're trying to deal with the only obstacle they have, namely Israel. Israel is the only country willing to fight in order not to let Iran dominate the region, because if Iran dominates the region, Israel is in an, ex in an existential threat. Now, it's interesting because Aviv Kochavi recently came out, it was this mm -hmm. week, I believe, or last yes. week, that he said, you know, if we don't take action right now, Israel is essentially in a very, yeah. very mm -hmm. dangerous position. Sure. And, and so now the U.S. Is, is making a move. What does that mean for Israel? At the moment, this move alone doesn't mean very much, except that there, it's an indication that the Americans are not going to take it lying down. In other words, I don't think that the Americans will or should take major military action against Iran. Mm -hmm. The sanctions are working. The Iranians are desperate. Let them collapse or at least be eroded very, very substantially by the sanctions. Here and there you can take military actions, but military actions are not the answer. The Iranians want it because the real question is the elections in the United States. Mm -hmm. Everything from an Iranian point of view Everything else is a footnote. The only thing that matters is, will you get something who will, somebody who will again capitulate to Iran in the United States? And this is their major objective. So as an American, I think it would be a very good response to say, here and there we will respond militarily, mm -hmm. but basically we continue with the economic pressure. All right, well, thank you so much thank for joining you. us with this update. Thank you. All right.
Moving, Moving back, back now to politics in Israel with the primaries out of the way. It seems that Prime Minister Netanyahu will bat uh, next battle will likely be in his push for Knesset immunity. I want to tell you one thing. The war is not against the democracy. The war is not even a part of the democracy. There is a war that I want to push for now. A war from the side of the Israq. של גנץ, לפיד וחבריהם, אי אפשר כבר לשמוע את זה. These words delivered to supporters at a Hanukkah menorah lighting ceremony indicate that the Prime Minister will likely request Knesset immunity from the three cases against him. Netanyahu now has less than 48 hours to formally request this benefit though, before his opportunity to do so is forfeit. And he has consistently evaded questions on whether he'll seek immunity or not. However, if he does file his request, he faces an uphill battle as well. Polls published Sunday show that a narrow majority of Israelis oppose giving Netanyahu immunity from the cases he faces. Again, though, Netanyahu says that immunity is necessary for the democracy, and he's even publishing archive video of then-Knesset Speaker Reuven Rivlin to prove his point. <laughs> אם הפרקליטות, אם מוסדות החקירה והשלטונות החוקרים יבואו ויחליטו שהם רוצים לצורך פוליטי לבוא ולנטרל חבר כנסת, הם יפתחו נגדו בחקירה ודברים היו מעולם. ודברים היו מעולם כאן במדינת ישראל. שפתחו חקירות נגד חברי כנסת? אנשים אשר עמדו להיות. למרות שלא היה חומר... בוודאי. Now whether he receives immunity from the Knesset or not, one thing is certain. The mere request would delay any potential trial by months, as the temporary Knesset cannot even vote on such a matter, meaning the final decision wouldn't be handed down until after the March 2nd elections. All right, Israel has broken yet another record. 2019 has seen a whopping 4.55 million tourists visiting Israel. That's an unprecedented number that means tourism has risen in the country for the third year in a row. That's right, tourism has risen in the Holy Land by 11% in just the last year alone, injecting around 23 billion shekels into the economy. So where are all these visitors coming from? Well, the leading countries for tourism in 2019 were the United States, France, Russia, Germany, and the UK. And get this, tourism from China increased by 51% from last year with almost 150,000 Chinese visitors making their way to Israel. So what can this major growth in tourism be attributed to? Well, Israel's tourism minister says that it's all thanks to the ministry's incredible marketing of Israel around the world, infrastructure development, and more incentives for international airlines to open up routes to Israel. Tourism is expected to keep on growing next year as well. Now, speaking of tourism, visitors may have something to look forward to, and that is lowered taxi prices. Mm. But not everybody's happy about that, and Nile TV's Nittany Manson has the scoop. The hustle and bustle of Tel Aviv was interrupted this afternoon when dozens of taxis blocked traffic. They started with a slow drive through major roadways, honking and making a scene. We have the strike because uh, the government want to make us in the taxometer uh, minus uh, 30 percent less, and we cannot afford it. We we work a lot hard for our uh, family, for money. It's uh, very difficult for us. So what are they protesting? Well, their livelihoods. The Ministry of Transportation has passed a new regulation that will go into effect in January of 2020. It will lower the price of intercity taxi rides by 30%, but make rides within cities like Tel Aviv 13% more expensive. Now, this is pretty good news for tourists looking to travel between Israel's major hubs or who want a better deal getting out of Ben Gurion Airport, because taxi costs will be significantly cheaper. But as you might imagine, the taxi drivers are not happy about it. This comes just a few weeks after the Israeli government decided to allow public transportation to function on the Jewish Sabbath, or the Jewish Day of Rest, in central Israel. Israelis have always had to depend on taxis or private vehicles to get around on the weekends because of the ban on buses and trains. And taxi drivers are already worried that the access to public transportation on weekends will take away from their income. Plus, now that it will cost more to ride taxis in the city, it could drive their customer base even further away. <laughs> So 
So how much does the average taxi ride cost in Israel? Well, in Tel Aviv, it's an average of 10 bucks compared to two in Cairo, Egypt. And cities like Los Angeles or New York are still higher at an average of $14. Cigarette butts, they litter the streets of Israel, but very few people are aware of the impact that they have on our environment. Well, joining us now in the studio is Julian Melser, the founder of Clean the Butts, an organization on a mission to clean up our country. So Julian, thank you for joining us. And you have been working since 2015, I think it is, right? To, to uh, clean up butts, cigarette no, butts from the streets? No, it started a bit later. The first cleanup ever was actually 2018, July 27th. Oh, wow. So tell us what you guys do. Um, we started off as just doing, you know, simple cleanups, you know, just open the Facebook event. Hey guys, come to clean up our home. We go to some local restaurants, be like, well, you want to give us a gift to give some of the volunteers? Mm -hmm. And then we realize, you know, you can create value out of something that is as negative as cigarette butt. You can actually bring your community together mm -hmm. over something as dirty as cigarette butts. So what, what's the turnout been? I mean, how many people have, have come to And why to cigarette, join us? why cigarette butts specifically? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so like many people have come, you know, we've had events, 50, 60 people, um, hundreds of people, you know, have came to clean up their home, like specifically for cigarette butts. And it's so interesting that one of the most um, toxic uh, habits that we have are actually one of the biggest um, litter in our world. So right. cigarette butts kill millions of people, you know, with the health thing, but also the type of people who smoke Maybe they don't care about their own health. They also don't care about the planet's health. And right. it's very connected. And I don't want to put it on the smokers. Well, it's, also, it's also like a cultural thing. I mean, that's one of the, one of the biggest cultural, uh, culturally accepted things to litter is still a cigarette butt. Yeah, for sure. Every movie you see, even until these days on Netflix, like very nice and new age TV shows, mm -hmm. the main guy at some point like throws a cigarette butt. Right. It's so interesting. It's such a cultural problem. Yeah. And many people don't even know they're made out of plastic. That's right. a crazy thing. Mm. Yeah, so cigarette butts, they're made out of plastic, which, I mean, first of all, they don't decompose, they, they don't decompose, they don't decompose right? Very quickly, so that's yeah. an issue, but then also, when they are decomposing, they're just full of junk, basically, that kind of spreads. Yeah, they, and... they become microplastic, and uh, not only are they microplastic, yeah. also they're filled with a filter, you know, that a was dirty trying filter. to filter yeah. chemicals mm -hmm. that mm. really hurt our bodies. So this enters the water. You know, one cigarette butt can poison about 20 liters of water if it sits there enough right. time. It's just crazy. So you guys have been bringing together, I mean, dozens and dozens of people to clean up different parts of Israel. What, what areas of Israel have you cleaned? Uh, we've been in Jerusalem, mostly in Tel Aviv beaches. We've done some cleanup in Kaysaria, mostly on the coastal line, mm -hmm. uh, all over the place. And the most amazing thing is that a real change is happening. And like, this is such a small thing if you really think about everything, you know, it's just a cigarette butt. Mm -hmm. But there's an amazing quote by the Buddha. He says, if you teach a kid why not to uh, step on a bug, it's as important for the bug as it is for the kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning the kid understanding sure. that something small means a lot, you can understand many other things. Right. Same with cigarette butts. They're so small. But you understand one, one small thing Huge can make difference. a big difference. Absolutely. You understand the rest of the struggle when right. it comes to the environmental. Right. Well, Julian, Bless you with, with your yeah, mission, and, uh, and thank you for beautifying We're coming out to the yeah. next thank Clean you, the Butt event. So we will be there. Thank you. All right, now millions of people across the world deal with losing their eyesight as they get older. It's called age-related macular degeneration, an incurable disease which can lead to blindness. Well, now Israeli researchers may have a cure, and ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh reports. For the first time ever, evidence has now been brought to light that suggests that the brain can integrate natural and artificial vision. And this is excellent news for any of the millions of people in the Western world who go blind from AMD every year. Age-related macular degeneration affects the light reception in our eyes, and it's typically onset by continued exposure to light, heat, and other stressors. But our peripheral vision is usually unharmed, so researchers from both Barilan and Stanford University are now experimenting with artificial retinal implants that partially restore central vision while leaving the peripheral vision alone. And not only does this process show incredible potential, it shows that our brains are perfectly capable of combining the artificial with the natural. It's incredible news. 
All right, it turns out piggy banks have been around for thousands of years. In fact, one was just discovered in central Israel. And no, it wasn't in the actual form of a piggy. We are in the Holy Land, of course, Aaron. Uh, but boy, did it contain some treasure. Exactly. A hoard of seven ancient gold coins have just been found hidden in a small clay jug during a dig in Yavne, Israel. The Antiquities Authority says that the shiny discovery dates back to the earlier Islamic period between the 7th and 9th centuries CE. So, who did they belong to? Well, archaeologists say they may have been a potter's personal savings since they were found at the entrance to a kiln site that's believed to have operated for several hundred years, producing store jars and cooking pots and bowls. And get this, the discovery was made just this week during Hanukkah, the eight-day Jewish festival where it's customary to gift chocolate golden coins. Well, these coins, of course, weren't chocolate, but archaeologists are still very excited because they provide a golden look into the past. Excavations from the site also uncovered a large wine-producing installation that dates all the way back to the 4th and 5th centuries BCE. All right, Israelis have made some huge breakthroughs this decade, but ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here to give you a rundown on the ones that will definitely be impacting the decade to come. Take it away. Hey guys, so let's just jump straight into it. First up, Professor Tal Dvir is the lead researcher of the revolutionary 3D heart study. He and his research team at Tel Aviv University shared the first ever vascularized engineered heart that was actually created in a 3D printer, which can eliminate the need of being waitlisted for a heart transplant. Next up is Dr. Talia Golan, a top oncologist and cancer researcher. She's discovered a new drug treatment to cure pancreatic cancer, which is the 12th most common cancer worldwide and is largely considered incurable. Nasir Yassin, or as most of us know him as Nas Daily, is next up on the list. This Arab-Israeli Harvard grad has been straight up owning the content creation game on social media for over three years now. He quit his six-figure job to travel the world and vowed to post one-minute meaningful videos every single day for 1,000 days. After hitting his mark, he's gone on to make weekly videos and even a series with Facebook called Planet Warriors. Kira Radinsky is next on the list. She's co-founder of the company Sales Predict, which basically predicts how successful certain products will be in the future. She's created tech that does large-scale data mining to make predictions that almost always come true. Her company was acquired by eBay in 2016, and Globes placed her second on the list of promising young people in, in the Israeli business world. Let's talk sports for a minute. Israeli rhythmic gymnastic Linoy Ashram is set to be Israel's best hope for a gold medal at the Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020. Ashlam has won medals in almost every competition she's taken part in, and she's not alone. Israeli judoka Sagi Muki was crowned the 2019 world champion and was ranked number one in judo in the world in March of this year. So we have big hope that the two will show up and show out for Israel in the upcoming Olympic Games. Amazing. I'm really yeah. looking forward to the Olympics this coming oh, yeah. year. Lot, I think that Israel's going to gonna really perform well. Anyhow, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy and cool, with an average low of about 44 degrees Fahrenheit, or 7 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow will be partly cloudy again, and with a chance of scattered showers, you can expect highs of just 60 or 15 degrees Celsius. And now before we leave you, Israelis are like most of the world, big fans of soccer. It's pronounced football. Yeah. Yeah. Well, check out this video of Israel's biggest football fan on tonight's tubing. This music is so ominous. I just, it, it fits really well. I mean, it, it makes him, like it makes him, uh, I don't know, kind of like the shark from Jaws, maybe? Yeah, I don't, honestly, like he's just trying, he's having a nice nap. He's, he's having a very good dream. dreaming about balls and playing in the open fields of Israel, maybe, but that's hilarious that his owner actually got that on camera. All right, well, that is it for today's news. Today's is exchange it? rate is 3.47 shekels to the American dollar. And for more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kierchuk. Thanks for watching.